Hello, welcome to exam blog, and today I'm going to go through the BMAT section 2 from November 2010. This is the scientific knowledge and applications paper of the BMAT and it is non-calculator. Just a quick mention before I start, it would be great if you could like the video, subscribe to the channel and turn on post notifications. It would be a massive help to me. Now, without further ado, let's get straight into the paper. Which row of the table correctly describes what happens when body temperature rises in a human? And we've got options from A to F, and it's asking us to look at temperature change detected by a particular part of the brain, if arterioles dilate or constrict, if hair erector muscles contract or relax, and capillaries under the skin move nearer to the skin surface, away from the skin surface, or they do not move. So, let's start with temperature change detected by. So, you have the option of the cerebral cortex and the hypothalamus. Straight away, you should know that temperature regulation occurs in the hypothalamus. This whole question is related to thermoregulation of the body. And that's where the hypothalamus comes into play. The hypothalamus regulates body temperature, whereas the cerebral cortex is more in charge of thoughts and language and attention span. So straight away, hypothalamus is the correct option. And therefore, A, B and C are incorrect. Now, moving on to the arterioles. So, when body temperature increases... The hypothalamus stimulates the arterioles to dilate in order to increase blood flow to the skin. So, therefore, constriction is wrong and we could eliminate D. And we're left with E as our answer. I'll continue going through the question though. Her erector muscles relax. We don't want them to contract because when they contract, they trap hot air close to the skin and we want to lose body temperature we want to lose body heat so contract it's wrong now capillaries in the skin this is more of a trick question capillaries don't really move they're there they don't move away from the skin they don't move nearer to the skin what happens is that these capillaries open and close they dilate or constrict it depending on the situation. They dilate just like arterioles when the body temperature is too high. And they constrict when the body temperature is too low. So, there we have it. Question one has been completed. Question number two. A compound of iodine and oxygen contains 63.5 grams of iodine and 20 grams of oxygen. Which of the following would be its formula? So iodine has an atomic weight of 127 and oxygen has an atomic weight of 16. So how do we solve this? We work out the empirical formula of this compound and then we could work out the molecular formula from there. So step one is to work out the moles of iodine and oxygen in this compound. So how do we do that? We do mass over atomic weight. So we go, we do 63.5 for iodine, 0.5 over 127 is equal to the moles. And that's equal to 0 0.5. They gave us quite nice easy numbers to work with. Now for oxygen, we're going to do 20 over 16, which is equal to 1.25. So, now we're going to form a ratio. So, iodine to oxygen is 0 0.5 to 1.25. Now, we want these numbers to be integers, so then we could get the molecular formula. So if we multiply both sides by 4, we'll get 2 to 5. And therefore, the answer to this question is I2O 
5, and therefore the answer is E. And that's question 2 completed. Question number 3. In a laboratory experiment, protactanium-234 undergoes radioactive decay by beta emission into uranium-234. The table below describes how the mass of uranium-234 present in the sample varies with time from the start of the experiment. Using the information in the table, approximately was the half-life of protactanium-234. So... This question is testing our understanding of radioactive decay and half-lives. The half-life is the time taken for the radioactivity of a specific isotope to fall by half its original value. Using this definition, we could solve this question. Immediately, we could assume that there is a direct correlation between the weight of protactanium-234 and the weight of uranium-234. Then we can state that there is a maximum weight of 16 grams for uranium-234, and this was achieved at 10.8 minutes, if we look at the table. This is because after 10.8 minutes, there was no increase in weight of uranium-234. Next, we are going to half 16 to find out what the half weight of uranium-234 was achieved in this experiment which is 8 milligrams. Therefore, the half life of protactanium-234 is 1.2 minutes. This is because half of 16 is 8, and this was achieved at 1.2 minutes. So the answer is A. And that's question 3 completed. Question number 4. I have two containers with different capacities. Initially, the larger one is full of water, and the smaller one is empty. I pour water from the larger container into the smaller container until they contain the same volume of water. The volume of water in the larger container is now P times its capacity, and the volume of water in the smaller container is Q times its capacity. Which one of the following statements about P and Q must be true? So. If the volume in each container is now the same, the volume in the larger container must exactly be half of what it was. So P is 0 0.5. The same volume of water went into the smaller container. So therefore, P is greater than 0 0.5. Therefore, the correct answer has to be C. And that is question four completed. Question number five. The following statements are about hormone levels and their effect. Statement number one. Increasing levels of insulin cause an increase in blood glucose levels. Statement number two. Increasing levels of estrogen increases the thickness of the inner lining of the uterus. Statement number three. Increasing levels of adrenaline increase the heart rate. Which of the statements are true? So, statement one, increasing levels of insulin cause an increase in blood glucose levels. This is incorrect. Insulin acts to lower the level of blood glucose by increasing the uptake of glucose by the cells and converting it into glycogen. Glucagon increases the blood glucose levels. So, any option given one is incorrect. So. A is incorrect, B is incorrect, and D is incorrect. Statement number two. Increasing levels of estrogen increases the thickness of the inner lining of the uterus. Statement number two is correct because estrogen is a hormone released during the menstrual cycle before ovulation in order to thicken the lining of the uterus in preparation for the implantation of a fertilized egg. So therefore, 2 is correct. So we could eliminate E. So straight away, we know the answer is C, but I might as well go through number 3. Increasing levels of adrenaline increases the heart rate. This should be relatively straightforward. 
Statement number three is correct because adrenaline is the fight or flight hormone, which is released in response to stress. It acts by increasing the heart rate. So the body cells, the muscle cells, are well supplied with oxygen rich blood. So more respiration can occur. So that's question five completed. Question number six. Carbon in the form of coke is used to reduce iron oxide in a blast furnace. The three stages are shown below. If 12 grams of carbon is used in stage two and all the carbon monoxide produced is used in stage three, what mass of carbon dioxide is produced in stage three? Immediately, we could ignore reaction one. This is because we already know the amount of carbon in reaction two. So we could work out the moles of the product in reaction two and feed that into reaction number three. So let's cross out reaction number one. Now, we know that carbon has a mass number of 12. And the amount of carbon used in reaction number two is 12 grams. So we want to work out the moles. So 12 over 12, because mass over MR is equal to moles, is equal to one mole. So we have one mole of carbon here. So therefore, we need to have two moles of carbon monoxide. So we now know the total amount of carbon monoxide produced in reaction number two. In reaction number three, we could straight away see that the number of carbon monoxide molecules used in the reaction is the same number of moles of carbon dioxide produced in the reaction. So therefore, we have a one-to-one -one ratio of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. So we have two moles of carbon monoxide entering reaction number three. So therefore, two moles of carbon dioxide is produced. So now we just need to work out the weight of the carbon dioxide, the mass. So we have two moles and we need to multiply that by the weight of carbon dioxide, which is 12 plus 16 plus 16 which is equal to 44. So 2 times 44 is equal to 88, and 88 is the answer. So the answer is D to question 6. And question 6 has been completed. Question number 7. The depth of water in a particular tidal harbour varies with time, as shown in the graph. If the variation in depth caused by the effect of the tide is considered as a wave, what are the amplitude and frequency of this wave? So immediately I would try and work out the amplitude. The amplitude is the distance measured from the centre equilibrium position of the wave to the peak or trough. So I would try and draw a line in the middle of this wave, the equilibrium. And this line is equal to 13 meters. So we take the peak value, which is 16 meters. 16 minus 13 is equal to 3. So we know the amplitude is equal to 3 meters. Next, we need to work out the frequency. The frequency is a measure of the number of times that a wave completes an oscillation per second. And this is the inverse of the period. So we know that for one full oscillation to be completed, it takes 12 hours. Because we'll take this as a start point. It next reaches that point at 12 hours. So we know the period is 12 hours. And therefore, the frequency is 1 over the period. But the thing is that our value of the period is in hours, and we need it in seconds for it to be in hertz. 
So we need to times it by 60 and times it by 60 again, which is equal to 1 over 12 times 3,600. So therefore, the answer to question number 7 is A. And that's question number 7 completed. Question number 8. A children's game is played on a square grid starting in the centre. Players spin two spinners to decide how to move their counters. The first spinner decides the direction, left, right, up or down, and the second spinner decides the distance, one, two, three or four squares. What are the chances that, after two moves, a player is exactly back where they started? So, for a player to end up exactly where they started, the move to focus on is actually the first move, not the second move. Why is this? This is because it doesn't really matter what direction or distance one must travel on the first move. Because in order to get back to where you started, the player must choose the opposite direction but the same distance to get back to their first move position. So we need to calculate the probabilities involved of the second move. So the probability of the opposite direction, whichever direction it was originally spun, is one quarter. The probability of the same number of moves is also one quarter, regardless of the number that was spun originally. So to work out the probability of ending up exactly where you started is one quarter times one quarter which is 1 16th, therefore the answer is C. That's question number 8 completed. Question number 9. Which one of the following correctly completes the statement? During the process of evolution, natural selection will favour individuals with A. An advantageous gene pool B. An advantageous allele C. A high reproductive capacity D, a wide geographic distribution. E, a narrow geographic distribution. So, statement A is incorrect because the gene pool describes all the alleles in all the individuals in a population. A, therefore, an individual cannot have a gene pool. So, statement A is incorrect. Statement B is correct because an allele is different of a different from a gene, and an allele is a different form of a gene. When one allele is advantageous over the other, that allele survives, and natural selection will favour those individuals. So the answer to this question is B. But we'll keep on going through the statements. Statement C is incorrect because you need to have the allele that will help you survive in order to reproduce. So if you have a disadvantageous allele, but you have a high reproductive rate, natural selection will not favor you. So C is incorrect. And in regards to D and E, they're incorrect because geographical distribution doesn't really have any impact on natural selection. They're correct. So the answer to nine is B. Question number 10. Which two of the following are produced by the complete combustion of fuels? 1. CH4, 2. CO, 3. CO2, 4. H2O, 5. HE, 6. NH3. This is a very simple question. The answer is going to be D, 3 and 4. When radioactive isotopes decay, they sometimes have to go through a succession of disintegrations to reach a stable isotope. These are called decay chains and involve the successive emission of numerous alpha and or beta particles. One such isotope is radon-219, which goes through a chain in which three alpha particles and two beta particles are emitted before reaching a stable isotope. What are the atomic and mass numbers of the resulting stable isotope? So straight away, you should be thinking, what is a alpha particle and what is a beta particle and what do they do? 
So an alpha particle decreases the atomic mass by four and decreases the atomic number by two. A beta particle leaves the mass the same, but increases the atomic number by one. So we know that radon 219 undergoes three alpha particle and two beta particle decays. So the mass number would decrease by 12 and the atomic number would decrease by four. So the new atomic number will be 86 minus four, which is equal to 82. And the mass number would be 219 minus 12, which is equal to 207. And you find the correct answer, which is C. And that is question 11 completed. Question number 12. The mean time for running a race by a group of 20 people was 54 seconds. The time for a second group of people were added and the value of the mean went up by 56 seconds. Which formula represents the relationship between the number of people in the second group P and the mean time of the second group T? So, straight away, I would first work out the total time of the first group. So I would do 20 times by 54 is equal to 10. 80. Then I would use algebra to work out what the total time of the second group was. So P times T is equal to PT. And then I would form an, an equation. So of working out the average time of the first and second group. So it will be 1080 plus PT. So you have the total time of both groups at the top as a numerator. And then the denominator, you have 20 plus P is equal to 56. The reason why we have the denominator of 20 plus P is because that is the total number of people in group A and group B, the first group and the second group. Now, it's just a matter of isolating P. So, what we're going to do is some rearranging. I'm going to do 10, 80 plus PT is equal to 56 plus P. Open that up, which is 11. 20 plus 56p. Now we're going to get all the p's on one side and everything else on the other side. So that will come to pt minus 56p is equal to 11, 20 minus 10, 80, which is equal to 40. T minus 56 is equal to 40. So now I'm just going to continue this right over here in this space. That will go P is equal to 40 over P T minus 56. So the correct answer is C. And that's question 12 completed. Question number 13. Signals are transmitted from one neuron to the next neuron by molecules. These statements are about this process. Statement number one, transmitter molecules are formed in the receptors. Statement number two, the signal is transmitted across the synapse by osmosis. 
Three transmitter molecules are released once the signal has been transmitted across the synapse. Four, the release of transmitter molecules is triggered by an impulse. Five, the signal is transmitted across the synapse by diffusion. So, statement number one, transmitter molecules are formed in this receptor. That is incorrect. This is because these transmitter molecules are forming in the neuron terminal before they're released and bind to the receptor. So, statement number one is wrong. And therefore, we can eliminate A, E, C. Statement number two. The signal is transmitted across the synapse by osmosis. This is incorrect. You should know that this is done by diffusion. Statement number two is incorrect. And we can eliminate D. Statement number three. Transmitter molecules are released once the signal has been transmitted across the synapse. This is wrong because transmitter molecules are released when the signal arrives at the synapse. Without the actual transmitter molecule, the signal wouldn't be able to go across the synapse in the first place. So three is incorrect, and that leaves us with four and five as our correct answer. So F is our answer, and that is question number 13 completed. Question number 14. Which of the following ionic equations? Question number 14. Which of the following ionic equations are correct? 1. x plus plus e minus goes to x. 2. x minus minus e minus goes to x. 3. O2 minus plus 2 e minus goes to O. 4. O2 minus minus e goes to O2. 5. 2. I minus minus 2 e minus goes to i 6 ca2 plus plus 2 e minus goes to ca so this is a relatively straightforward question in which the charges on the left hand side need to equal the charges on the right hand side and we need to have the same number of atoms on the left hand side and at the right hand side and if you guys weren't aware e minus refers to an electron so, statement number one, that is correct because a positive plus negative charge equals a neutral charge and there's the same number of atoms on each side, so that is correct. Statement number two, x minus minus e minus goes to x, you have a negative charge minus a negative charge which goes to a neutral charge. That is correct. 3, O2 minus plus 2, E minus goes to O. That is incorrect because on the left hand side, we have a charge of minus 4 or 4 minus. And on the right, we have a charge of 0, a neutral charge. That's not possible. So 3 is incorrect. 4. O2 minus minus E minus goes to O2. That's incorrect, firstly, because you have one atom over here, and then you have two atoms over here in total. So that's straight away incorrect. But also the charges don't add up. We have a neutral charge over here, and on the left-hand side we have a... 1 minus charge or minus 1 charge. So 4 is incorrect. 5, 2i minus minus 2e minus goes to i. That's incorrect because you don't have the same number of atoms on each side. You have 2 on this side and you have 1 on this side. So 5 is incorrect and therefore 6 is the right answer, but we will go through that. A so two positive charges plus two negative charges equals a neutral charge. Six is correct. So the correct answer is therefore A, and that's question 14 completed. Question number 15. The circuit shows five identical filament bulbs designed to work 
at 12 volts connected in a circuit with two switches. Switch P is initially open and switch Q is initially closed. Switch P is then closed and switch Q is opened. Compare their brightness before these changes were made. How has the brightness of bulb X and Y changed? So, initially when switch Q is closed, the current will bypass all the bulbs except bulb Y. Now, with this information, we can now determine the path of current in each of the next cases. Initially, switch Q is closed, so all the current will be passing through bulb Y. This is the maximum amount of current, so bulb Y will be the brightest it can possibly be. When switch Q is open, the current will be passing through other bulbs, and therefore the current through Y will be less, and bulb Y will get dimmer as a result. Initially, for bulb X, there was no current passing through it, so it was off. On closing the switch of P, current flows through the loop containing bulb X and that parallel to it. Bulb X will light up. The condition of switch P is immaterial since it only determines the amount of current that goes through bulb X, but regardless, it will become brighter. The answer must be B then as a result. And that is the answer to question 15. Question number 16. A shape is formed by drawing a triangle ABC inside the triangle ADE. BC is parallel to DE. AB is equal to 4. BC is equal to X. DE is equal to X plus 3. DB is equal to X minus 4. So first things first, label the triangle AB for BC. X, D, E, X plus 3, D, B, X minus 4, X minus 4. So, immediately you should be able to tell these triangles are similar because they have the same angles. So they share angle A, A, B, C, and A, D, E are the same angle, and A, C, B and angle A, E, D are the same. So therefore the triangles are similar. So you could form a fraction which we could solve of D, E over B, C is equal to A, T over A, B. So let's fill this out. So DE is equal to X plus 3. BC is equal to X. AD is equal to X. And AB is equal to 4. Now we need to solve this equation. So I'm going to continue this on the other side. So we're going to go 4x plus 3 is equal to x squared. And then let's just rewrite this. Then we're going to expand, so that goes 4x plus 12 is equal to x squared. Bring everything to one side. So x squared minus 4x minus 12 is equal to 0. Now we need, this is a quadratic equation which we could solve. So what multiples of 12 minus each other equal 4? 6 and 2. So we know x minus 6, x plus 2 is equal to x squared minus 4x minus 12. Now, what are our values of x? x is equal to 6, 
and x is equal to minus 2. We cannot have a negative value for length. That's not possible. So let's get rid of that. So x is equal to 6, and it's asking us to work out the length of de. de is x plus 3, which is therefore equal to 6 plus 3, which is equal to 9. The answer is c. And that's the answer to question number 16. Question number 17. In the family tree shown below, both P and Q are carriers of a recessive allele which causes a condition. Only individuals R and X have the condition. What is the percentage likelihood of S, T and U being carriers? So, this question is on Mendelian genetics. We know that we have two copies of each gene, one from our mother and one from our father. Expression of a trait is dependent if the trait is dominant or recessive. Dominant genes only need one copy to be expressed, and recessive genes require both copies of that particular gene to be expressed. So, on to the question. We know that P and Q are carriers, so they each have a genotype of AA. Using a Punnett square, we could work out the genotype of their offspring. So let's quickly draw that out. And when I say AA, I mean big A, little a. So big A, so big A, little a. Big A, little a. So, got big A, big A, big A, little a, big A, little a, little a, little a. Using this information, the chance of S and T being carriers is 50%. We can determine that. U is definitely 100% heterozygous recessive because X, U's offspring, has at least one recessive allele. Therefore, the answer to this question is E. And that's the answer to question number 17. Question number 18. Magnesium hydrogen phosphate contains the following ions. Mg2+, plus, H+, plus, and PO4-. Which one of the following is a possible formula for magnesium hydrogen sulfate? This is a relatively simple chemistry question. It's just making sure each compound there has a neutral charge. And the one that does have a neutral charge, a charge of zero, is your answer. So option A is incorrect because the overall charge is 2-. So let's give that a big cross. C is incorrect because it has a net charge of 2 plus, which we don't want. D is incorrect because the charge would be 2 plus again. E, the charge is 2 plus as well. And F, the charge is 3 plus. So your answer is B, where the net charge is 0. And that's the answer to question number 18. Question number 19. The diagrams below show velocity time or distant time graphs for four different objects, P, Q, R, and S. Which graphs show an object accelerating at 2.4 meters per second? This is a relatively straightforward question to answer. You just need to calculate the accelerations and sometimes the velocity before the acceleration of each of the graphs. So the formulas that you need are, are velocity is equal to distance over time and acceleration is equal to velocity over time. Let's first do P. So P, the difference in velocity from start to finish is 10. So 10 over the difference in time, 24, is not equal to 2.4. We could see that straight away. So P cannot be our answer. 
because straight away we could see the acceleration is below 1 and we need it to be 2.4. Q. Q, the difference in velocity is 48. It is in 50. It's just below. You, as you can see for the top line, it says 60. It's just below. Moving on. Q. The difference in velocity is 48. So moving on to Q. The difference in velocity is 48 and the time is 20 seconds, which is equal to 2.4. So we know Q is a correct option. Now looking at R, R is a distance time graph. So we first need to work out velocity and then we can work out speed. So the velocity of R is, I'm just gonna write that down straight away, is 2.4. But the thing is that, yes, it is 2.4, but that's the velocity. So we have to divide the velocity again by 5 to get the acceleration, so 2.4 over 5 is equal to 0 0.48, so R cannot be our right answer. S, so we need to yet again work out the velocity and then the acceleration, so 100 over 240 is equal to 0 0.42 to two decimal places. We could straight away already tell that this isn't going to give us the right acceleration, but I'll still complete it. 0 0.42 divided by 240 is equal to 0 0.0017 going on. So which of the graphs show an object accelerating at 2.4 meters per second, and the answer for that is B. And that is question number 19 completed. Question number 20. The total surface area of a cylinder is numerically the same as its volume. The radius of a cylinder is R and the height is H. Express H in terms of R. So straight away, we need to write down what the volume and surface area are equal to. So the volume is equal to pi r squared h, and the surface area is equal to 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. And I'll explain the surface area to you quickly. So the reason why you have 2 pi r squared is because at the top and the bottom of a cylinder, you have two circles, and the area of the circle is pi r squared. The reason why you have 2 pi r h is because essentially the side of a cylinder is a rectangle, and the length of that rectangle is the circumference of that circle, and the height of that rectangle is the height of that cylinder, hence why you have 2 pi r squared h. So we're told that the surface area is equal to the volume. So we just need to make these two equations equal each other. So pi r squared h is equal to 2 pi r h plus 2 pi r squared. And now we need to collect the h's on one side and leave everything else on the right hand side and then isolate h on the left hand side. So pi r squared h minus 2 pi r h is equal to 2 pi r squared. So Going to put h over here, pi r squared minus 2 pi r is equal to 2 pi r squared 
Now we're going to bring all of the 2 pi r squared minus 2 pi r onto the right hand side. So h is equal to 2 pi r squared over pi r squared minus 2 pi r. And now we just need to simplify. So straight away we could divide the top and bottom of the right hand side fraction by r and pi. So which is equal to 2r over r minus 2 is equal to h. And what do you know? That's equal to a. So the right answer for question 20 is a. And that is question 20 completed. Question number 21. The following statements are about nuclear division by meiosis and mitosis. Statement 1. In animals, meiosis only occurs in reproductive organs. 2. Mitosis can result in the formation of clones. 3. Meiosis results in two nuclei. 4. Mitosis results in four nuclei. 5. Meiosis does not occur during asexual reproduction. Which of these statements are true? I'll go through the way that I would do it in the exam and I'll go and explain then for each statement. Straight away reading those statements, I know that option three and four are incorrect. Meiosis results in four nuclei, four daughter cells each containing one nuclei, and mitosis results in two nuclei, each daughter cell containing one nuclei each. So that would only leave us with one, two, and five, so the answer is B. Now, going through each statement individually, I've already gone through three and four, but one, in animals, meiosis only occurs in reproductive organs. That is true, because the formation of gametes only occur in reproductive organs. Two, mitosis can result in the formation of clones. This is true because mitosis creates genetically identical daughter cells, which are clones. Statement five, meiosis does not occur during asexual reproduction. Statement five is correct because during asexual reproduction, only mitosis occurs. This is because there is no need for the production of gametes. So that leaves us yet again with one, two, and five. So the answer is B to this question. And that's question 21 completed. Question number 22. A student prepared nitrobenzene by the following reaction. C6H6 plus HNO3 goes to C6H5NO2 plus H2O. Starting with 3.9 grams of benzene, the student obtained 3.69 grams of nitrobenzene. What is the percentage yield? So this is a very straightforward amount of substance question. Step one is to work out the moles of benzene. So we know the mass already. We now need to work out the MR. There are six carbons, so I'll do six times 12, which is equal to 72. And there's six hydrogens, so 72 plus six is equal to 78. So now we can work out the moles of benzene. So 3.9 divided by 78 is equal to 0 0.05, and that's the moles of benzene. And now there is a one-to-one -one ratio between benzene and nitrobenzene. So we know that there are 0 0.05 moles of nitrobenzene available. We now need to work out the MR of nitrobenzene to work out the mass. So we have, yet again, six carbons, we have five hydrogens, so 72 plus five, plus one nitrogen, so 14, plus two oxygen, 16 plus 16, which equals to 123. Now we do 0 0.05 times by 123. That equals to approximately 6 grams. You can go a bit more precise, but in this exam you have to be quite fast-paced. So then you're going to do 
3.69 over 6. So your actual yield over your theoretical 100% yield times by 100, which is equal to 60%. So your answer is C for this question. And that's question number 22 completed. Question number 23. In an ornamental fountain, water is squirted vertically upwards through a nozzle by a pump. 5 kg of water pass through the nozzle each second, and the water reaches a height of 5 meters after leaving the nozzle. What is the power of the pump, assuming 100% efficiency? And at what speed does the water leave the nozzle? Take G to be 10 newtons per kilogram. So this question is asking us to use several physics equations to work out the power and the speed of the water. And I'm going to first start off with working out the power. So power is equal to work done over the elapsed time. So how else can work done be expressed? It could be expressed as energy. So I'm going to work out the gravitational potential energy of the water. So Eg is equal to m times by g times by delta H, which is equal to the mass 5 times by G, which they gave us 10 times by the height 5 meters, which is equal to 250 joules. So we've worked out the work done. Now we need to work out what the elapsed time is. So reading the question, it says water is squirted vertically upwards through a nozzle by a pump 5 kg of water passes through the nozzle each second. So it's 250 joules over 1 is equal to the power. So therefore the power is equal to 250. Now, we need to work out the speed of the water. How I'm going to work out the speed is by using the equation of kinetic energy. So E equals a half mv squared. So we already know the energy from the gravitational potential energy answer. So 250 is equal to 0 0.5 times by the mass, which is 5 v squared. So now we want to work out what v is. v is equal to the square root of 2 times 250 over 5. So V is then equal to 10. The reason for this is because 2 times 250 is 500. 500 over 5 is 100. The square root of 100 is 10. So therefore, the answer to this question is G. And that is question number 23 completed. Question number 24. A design is set up by joining the points which are one third of the way along the side of a square. This forms a second square as shown. This process is repeated. Calculate the area of the fourth square as a fraction of the original square. So what I would do is set the length of one side to be equal to L. So... This is therefore equal to one third L. This is equal to two third L. And there are four triangles in this one square and there's a smaller square inside. So the original square has an area of L squared. That's a given. Now the area of each triangle in the diagram is equal to a half base times height. We know that. So let's work out the area of this triangle over here. So we're going to do a half times by a third L times by 2L over 3 or 2 third L, which is equal to 1 over 9L squared. Now, there are four triangles in this one square. So we need to multiply this 1 ninth L squared by 4. So that goes to 4 ninths L squared. 
So the area of the second square has an area of five of the ninths of the original square. If this pattern continues, then the third square will have an area of five over nine of the second square, and then the third square will continue this pattern. So the fourth square will be five ninths as large as a third square. So if we write this out, so five over nine, so this is second square, times by five over nine, which is the third square, five over nine, which is the fourth square, is equal to one, two, five over seven, two, nine. And we could set L squared to equal one, hypothetically. So therefore, the answer to this question is C. And that is question number 24 completed. Question number 25. The hormonal and nervous system are often compared because of their similar roles in the body. Which of the following statements about the two systems are true? Statement one, the nervous system relies on electrical impulses to work. Two, both the hormonal and nervous systems activate target structures. Three, the fast response in the body are produced by the nervous system. Four, only the hormonal system relies on the activity of chemicals. Five, parts of the hormonal system may be controlled by the central nervous system. So statement one is false because the central nervous system requires chemicals such as neurotransmitters across synapses. So statement one, you are gone. Statement number two, both the hormonal and nervous system activate target structures. This is true because both systems are used in homeostasis to activate organs or tissues. So let's give that a tip. Statement number three is true because the nervous system transmit electrical signals very quickly, whereas the hormonal system requires chemical signals to be transported in the blood to the target tissue or organ, which is a lot slower. Let's give that a tick. Statement four is incorrect because the nervous system also relies on chemicals such as neurotransmitters, which I discussed in statement one. And statement five is correct because the central nervous system does have control over some parts of the hormonal system, most notably being adrenaline and the release of it from the adrenal gland. When you're in a high stress situation, adrenaline is released. So let's give five a tick. So therefore, the answer to question number 25 is E, and that's question number 25 completed. Question number 26. Cyclohexene C6H10 is drawn as the diagram. Apply this information for the stereotype structure shown below to find the total number of carbon atoms in the molecule. So I personally would just use my AS level chemistry knowledge and I know skeletal drawings as a result of my knowledge of AS chemistry. So everywhere where I see a intersection of two lines, a point, I'm just going to draw a C. Now from here, Wherever I see a carbon, I'm going to count that. So there are 20 carbon atoms in total. I drew on 17 and there's another three from the two methyl groups and the other group that's attached. So the answer is B, 20. And that's question number 26 completed. Question number 27. A car of mass 800 kg moves up an incline of 1 in 20 at a constant speed of 20 meters per second. The frictional force opposing the motion is 500 newtons. How much work has been done by the engine after the car has moved 50 meters? So what you need to consider here is work done and the two pieces of work done that's occurring here. So you have the gravitational energy change that occurs and you have the work done by friction. So first I'm going to solve for the gravitational energy change. So I'm going to use the formula EP is equal to mg times delta H. So I need to first work out the difference in height. So it says every, the incline is one in every 20. So if I do, we're traveling up 50 meters divided by 20, 
that is equal to 2.5. So I can now substitute my values in here. So 800 kg times by 10 times by 2.5 is equal to 20,000 joules. Now, I've now worked out the gravitational energy change. Now I need to work out the work done against friction. So, I'm told that there is 500 newtons of friction force opposing the motion. So, work done, I'm going to use this formula, work done is equal to force times distance. So I know the force is 500 newtons, and I'm traveling 50 meters. So 500 times 50 is equal to 25,000. Now I just add these two together, 20,000 plus 25,000 joules. That comes up to 45,000 joules, and that's equivalent to 45 kilojoules, and that is the answer to D. And that is question number 27 completed.